um, uh, resume of not only scholarly work, but also as a public intellectual. Uh, and his uh, voice in uh, Louisville and Kentucky and in the United States uh, has been recognized and is an important uh, uh, part of the conversation. And uh, Dr. Jones, having you with us today, is it's a real uh, privilege and honor, and I, I appreciate you making time to be with us. Uh, community colleges in Texas, uh, as we were talking a few minutes ago, uh, have a lot of variety. They have, they have their own boards and kind of make their own decisions. We have everything from large urban districts in Houston and Austin and San Antonio and Dallas and El Paso, uh, but also small schools up in the Texas hand, Panhandle, Northeast Texas, Far West Texas, South Texas, and uh, everything from enrollments over 100,000 down to just a, a few thousand. And all of those experiences are different. Um, and yet there are these similar threads that are running through all of our conversations. And one of the conversations that we've been having for some time, but has really uh, come up as a, as a pivotal and important topic uh, this year has been issues uh, related to systemic injustice and uh, addressing issues of inequality and injustice, uh, as particularly as they divide along uh, lines of race. And the conversations that we've been having with our members and that our members have been having with each other uh, is how do we talk about this on our campuses? How do we talk about this among colleagues, the way we, the way we run the institutions? And how do we have them with our students? Um, because students are saying, we need to talk about this. And some of our members are saying, I don't feel equipped to, I don't know how to lead that discussion. And uh, so I'd really like to, to talk about some of these issues and, and especially with, uh, with that in mind as, as a faculty member, uh, what do we need to know? How, do we, how should we be thinking about this? And how can we help all of our students and our communities um, arrive at a, at a good outcome because of the conversation. So uh, that's, that's really, <laughs> it's a tall order and I know we can't uh, uh, do it all in one conversation, but, but I hope this can, this can be a good start. Um, why don't we start uh, with, uh, with you and kind of where, where you are in this. You're in Louisville. Uh, we're having this conversation all over the country. Louisville has gotten a lot of national attention because of, of uh, cases and circumstances there. What does this look like from your perspective and in, and in your experience? Okay. Well, well, first of all, brother, brother Richard Moore, let me say thank you to you for inviting me to hang out with you for a little while. You are brothers in arms with my dear brother, Reverend Joseph Phelps here in Louisville, who's done yeoman's work, you know, for the people. And he, he is a, uh, I mean, a warrior. And so any friend of his is a friend of mine. So, so thank you and the work that you're doing there. Uh, also would be remiss if I didn't thank you to Sister Katie Agnew, who has worked to put this session together. And even though I said, I, I, I did not give her a title as she requested, um, because you know, I'm 95 years old now and I forget things. She still put it together and, and gave it a title. So thank you to Sister Katie who's kept everything together. It's usually the people behind the scenes that makes these things possible for all of us. So I wanted to get that out of the way in the first place. To all the brothers and sisters who are joining us um, today, uh, thank you for coming to hang out with a, a poor old boy from the housing projects of Atlanta. You know, brothers and sisters across lines of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, religious choice. Um, if, if we're going to do anything different, then we're going to do it together. That is very important for us to understand. And um, certainly I understand in Texas, some, sometimes things get a little bit more unwieldy. As you just said, your system is big. But everything is big in Texas, right? A um, good friend of mine is from Houston. Another dear friend of mine teaches at the University of Texas at Austin. I've spent a decent amount of time in your state. Um, I understand your challenges. I understand your blessings. And so hopefully we can spend some time together today and, and get to the heart of some things. What I don't want to do is lecture you. I think that's boring. Um, as I told Brother Richard before you all joined us, I've spent the entire day 
um, in interviews for a new dean of the College of Arts and Sciences here at the University of Louisville. And there's a lot of lecturing that goes on with academics. Academics are very, very smart people, but we don't tend to play well with others. And, and we are about as exciting as watching paint dry, usually. You know, so you can go to an academic conference ses session and, and there'll be great information to awake. So one of my charges for the next, you know, 45 to 50 minutes is to engage you so that, you know, you will stay awake. And I think one thing about staying awake is that people are, are, are participating in what's going on with them. If I'm just talking for the next hour, then there is a problem. So I will lean on you as I lean on my students who participate in this conversation, ask me questions. I can ask you questions and we can try to reason together. Now, you ask where I'm situated in this. Let me tell you a quick story. You talked about my academic Vita, which I, I guess you've shared with people. And Vitas are very interesting things because you put everything on them. And so they can make you look like Hercules, you know? And, and so some people think my Vita is great. And here is, you know, the, 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 the well-known professional story that people will tell about Ricky Jones. I don't say Dr. Ricky Jones, I told Brother Richard, I only make people who I don't like call me doctor, you know, to try to put, put them in their place. But outside of that, you know, I go by the name that my mother gave me, which is Ricky. But this Dr. Jones guy is a guy who graduated from an elite high school in Atlanta, Georgia, being Northside High School in one of the richest areas of the country, uh, being Buckhead. Um, went on to prep school at the United States uh, Naval Academy's Preparatory School in Newport, Rhode Island. Then went on to Annapolis, Maryland, to the U.S. Naval Academy for the first two years of, of my college career. And then transferred from there to Morehouse College, one of the most elite HBCUs in the country. So I'd like to tell people I went to the same schools as, as Jimmy Carter um, and John McCain and Julian Bond. Maynard Jackson and Martin Luther King Jr. You know, so people who have impacted the world in, in myriad ways. Went on from there to the University of Kentucky where I became only the second African American to get a, a PhD in political science and finished that PhD when I was 28 years old. By the time I was 35 years old, I was a chair of the Department of Pan-African Studies at the University of Louisville. Had written, you know, a book, uh, a number of articles, and had you know developed quite a professional footprint. That's the professional story that people love to hear. Here's the real one. I'll introduce you to Ricky, not Dr. Jones. I'm a kid whose mother gave birth to him when she was 15 years old. The time she get, had sex, she got pregnant. And she was impregnated by a man who was 34 at the time. I did not meet my father until I was 35. He could have walked up and spat on me and I wouldn't have known who he was. Because my mother had a child very young, she never finished high school, even though she was a very good student. So I became the first person in my immediate family to even graduate high school. My grandmother, ended up raising me. My grandmother, who was born in the early 1930s in rural Georgia, never went to school. She was a, a domestic worker in Atlanta. Um, she was virtually illiterate to the time of her death. And she raised me in the housing projects because that's all that we could afford. She, ironically, when we talk about that elite high school I went to, I was bused to that high school, which ironically was in the neighborhood of many of the homes that my grandmother cleaned when she would go to work each day. So every day I would take an hour to hour and 15 minute bus ride from Southwest Atlanta, which is deeply impoverished, to North Atlanta, which is incredibly affluent. Um, so I was always living in these different worlds. So when you talk about how I experienced the issues of race, not just race, but also class, um, intellectual deprivation, social, political, economic deprivation, all of these things, these are things that I have lived. So I'm not a blue blood, right? Uh, I'm not a blue blood at all. Um, I, I, I come out of that experience in, in one of the largest cities in the country. And so even though I have a degree in political science, I committed discipline suicide, in effect, and became a Black Studies scholar 
because I think that is a population that deserves attention. It needs proselytizers. It needs organic intellectuals for those who like the, the academic lingo. I try to stay away from the academic lingo usually because I think it's exclusionary. You know, we can always try to prove that we're the smartest people in the room and we lose people all over the map. So, but rarely do we find folk in higher education who come out of those experiences and therefore are comfortable, one, talking about those experiences and engaging folks face to face, hand to hand, arm in arm, who are living through those experiences now as we try to work through them and engaging students who are coming to colleges and universities, community colleges all over this country, who are coming out of those experiences in the same way that I did and helping them to make their transition. So I'll say this, this is what we're facing right now, folks, and we are seeing it. Whether we like it or not, demography is real. We are living in the most multiracial, multicultural, multi-ethnic America that we have ever seen, and that is not going to change. We cannot call ourselves serious educational institutions if we are not engaging those experiences and retooling American education from K through 12, all the way through community colleges to four-year colleges and to graduate and professional schools. If we are not dealing with that, we deal with evolving 21st century problems that we're seeing if we're still functioning with mid 20th century ideologies and mid 20th century educational paradigms. We simply can't do it. So it's not just about us diversifying curricula. It's about us diversifying the faculty, the staff, the student bodies, the leadership of our schools, because they're going to come at things a little bit different. We don't learn the most from people who are like us and think like us. We learn the most from people who are the most unlike us. That's what diversity is really about. I don't get into all of these newfangled terms, the diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion movement, which quite often is populated by people who've gone and gotten some certificate who've never been in, engaged in this work at all, but they've gotten a certificate and it becomes vulgar careerism. And you figure out once they come to your universities or your colleges or your system that they really don't know what the hell they're doing. They're not connected people at all, especially in the It's not a calling, right? And it needs to be a calling if we're going to transform the society. Or now people are using this new term, anti-racism, which, you know, my friend Ibram X. Kendi has made popular. I don't think this is just really about anti-racism, though. I think this is a humanization project as we're dealing with what America is, how it came to be this way, and then what we can do. We're dealing with sins, I believe. And I'm not, I don't want to get religious here, but I think we're dealing with sins. America's original sin was what happened to indigenous people, what happened to the first world people, the Native Americans. What was done to them was a sin and a shame. I don't think any of us can deny that. We, we've seen the almost the complete evisceration of an entire population of people so that folks could have a land that wasn't theirs in the first place. And then, of course, the second sin was slavery and the racism that came from both of those transgressions. And we're still dealing with the legacies of those things to this day. So the question is, it, what happened? We have to know what happened. But the, the, the greater question is, what are we going to do moving forward? And that's going to take people who are committed, who are absolutely committed to learning, to engaging, and committed to fighting. Because it's not like everybody in the country is committed to those things. But we have to be. And I think, lastly, and I want to get to your conversation, your, your questions, you know, our discussion. If we kind of lock, up, lock arms for, for the next few minutes. What can we do in education? We cannot change the world single-handedly. We have to do it one sphere at a time, one campus at a time. But all of us, me here at the University of Louisville, you on your respective campuses, you're in places that can be manageable if you partner with like-minded people and try to get a few people that you can reform and bring over to your side to create a new and better world in the space where you are existing and then replicate far and wide. You know, I have faith that we can create better campuses. I have faith that we can create better cities and better states and a better country if we're committed to it, but it's not easy work because it's something that we have avoided for a very long time because it's painful for some people and some people are still avoiding it. There are some folks now who say the critical race theory itself is un-American and racist. I doubt that some of them know what critical race theory is. So it's our job as educators to teach them, 
to push back against that approach if we're serious about this work and creating a better world. So I, again, I thank you for letting me hang out with you for a little while this afternoon so that we can try to do what we can to put our heads together, alleviate a little bit of the stress, but put this burden on our shoulders collectively because if everybody's carrying just a little bit, that means that nobody has to carry it all. So I appreciate you, Brother Moore. I appreciate you, Sister Katie, and I appreciate everybody that's here. So let's have at it. Thank you for, for those thoughts. I'm, I'm wondering, I can imagine you have a, you know, rooms full of students uh, or, or Zoom meetings full of students um, that you're talking with who come from a, a range of, of backgrounds, uh, different experiences and things that they're bringing to their educational experience. Do you find that there are some things that they particularly need from you, uh, things that you can do to, to create an environment in those spaces, um, either to bring them up to speed on some things that maybe their upbringing didn't introduce them to, or to create a space where they're free to share. How, how do you set the table for the, for the discussions you have with your students? Yeah. You know, Brother Richard, America's still siloed. America's still incredibly segregated. Uh, Ricky, uh, I think it's important, one, to remember before, who and what you are. First of all, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to turn my camera off. I'm getting a little delay in your signal, and it, I, it may help the feed be a little less glitchy. So if you see me disappear from the screen, I'm just going to do that so that your feed uh, is a little bit better. We'll see if this helps. Uh, I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. No, no problem. Ho hopefully it's not on my end and we can work through these technical difficulties. This is a problem that, that we have and we're not face to face with one another. But I, I think, first of all, you got to remember who you are, what you are in the context of what students need and what you can bring that's different. You know, this idea of assimilation sometimes I think is incredibly problematic for a lot of folk. At core, as you all understand, I'm a street kid from, from Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm a black male. Quite often, when students get to me at the University of Louisville, it doesn't matter if they're black, white, Asian descended, Hispanic, Latinx, the, I'm quite often the first black teacher, usually the first black male teacher that they've had in their entire life, mm. right? And so it is incumbent upon me to bring something unique that is coming from my culture, you know, my educational, social experience that they're not gonna get somewhere else. So I can embrace those street kids in ways that a lot of folks can. But also because of my educational background, I can embrace the kids from the suburbs or rural America as well. And so it, it, I think this modeling is incredibly important. So black kids can see themselves White kids can see a black person to, who, who they can relate to, as well as Asian descended kids, Hispanic descended kids, all of them can see something that they relate to. This is the importance of diversity for real. The human species is diverse because we need to be diverse for viability, not because of race color, but race as a species. So our institutions are the same way. We have to have people that all of our students can get something out of, they can't get it from one person, they can get it from somebody else. So my thought is to try to meet students where they are, not disrespect their intellect, not disrespect their experiences and their needs, to listen to them, first of all, about where they are, and then try to bring them along. So that's my approach, you know, to, to, to not come in and play traditional professor because I don't think I am a traditional professor. We don't need more traditional professors. We have enough of them. We need some folks who are connecting with our students in different ways. We need some folks who are connecting with those kids coming from those farms who's who've never seen a black person in their life, right? Who've never seen a Hispanic brother or sister in their life. We need to get with these black kids who are coming from the inner city like me. I didn't go to school with a white kid until I was in ninth grade, right? And so we got to connect with them as well. So we're having all these experiences. So from the, as a friend of mine likes to say here in, in Kentucky, now from the hood to the hollow. So I don't care if you're from Cabrini Green in Chicago, of course, they've shut that down. Or if you're from Astoria, Oregon, where I ended up on summer cruise when I was at the Naval Academy, you know, which felt like traveling back in time. 
Universities, classrooms are the places where we all meet and they need people to facilitate that, that joining, that partnership, that family type of environment, you know, intellectually and socially. So that's, that's what I try to do all the time with my students, you know, whether it's face-to-face -face or online. Again, we're face-to-face -face right now and that works. And, and that's gonna create a very different conversation when you engage them that way. Um, it's it's right. the head and the heart. It's, it's bringing your history to the discussion um, that where they don't feel alienated from what's going on in the class. We, we have a question that, that's come in that's asking, how do you address these items in and out of a classroom when you've been advised to stay out of controversial issues uh, during social media awareness meetings? Uh, while this may not be con a controversial is issue for a sociology professor, it may be viewed as such by students of a science professor, uh, even if you package with your materials. Do y'all have any of those issues at your institution where they're asking you not to do things that might ruffle feathers or, um, or, or maybe be off topic with, within a discipline? Yeah, th there's some people certainly that feel that way. There's some leadership that feels that way. But he, here's, here's what I would say. If you're dealing with that at your school, you're dealing with bad leadership. You know, that, that's my thought. You're dealing with bad leadership. Like at the University of Louisville, we like to say that we are a, a leading metropolitan university that continuously um, tries to promote town and gown connections. If you are advising your faculty, staff, or students to stay away from controversial issues, then you really are not trying to develop those ties that is a question of leadership and it has to be challenged right it has to be challenged race and racism that's those are controversial issues we gotta face them head on sexism that's a controversial issue it has to be faced head on homophobia it's controversial it has to be faced head on right and so it it seems to me that something is wrong just now at this moment if people start to talk about black Black Lives Matter. It's up to you all. It's up to all of us to challenge those administrators who have been saying stay away from the controversial issues, but then they turn around and put a Black Lives Matter banner on a building on their campus, right, to try to put up a, a particular uh, uh, um, image of what's, what matters at the university. I think if we have good leadership, leadership matters. So if somebody says let's stay away from this, you got to challenge that leadership. And yeah, it happens at the University of Louisville. I'm considered a controversial fellow, but you know, uh, as that old saying said about women, you know, uh, safe women never change the world, well-behaved women never change the world. I would expand it. Well-behaved people never change the world. So if we're committed to being well-behaved, that's what we're gonna get. So universities, community college systems, educational systems like to talk about being progressive. They like to talk about being diverse even. But when you really drill, drill down into it, and the college president said this recently, when you really drill down into it, we don't do as good a job as a lot of publicly traded companies. So we got to pay attention to those contradictions in every space where we are. And certainly, certainly professors who enjoy um, the privilege of tenure, then you need to use that. My thought is this, in every space, professors should take care of associate professors. Associate professors take care of, of, of assistants. All professors take care of staff all the way down to folks who are working in the physical plant division at your universities and then everybody comes together to take care of students and collectively you face those issues with a level of tenacity and bravery that bad leadership cannot stand up to that's bad leadership if somebody tells you to avoid those issues because what they're really telling you to do is let's let's promote the status quo or let's stay rooted in the past and so this this so is really as many people as you can. Yeah, and th so this is really a governance issue um, within the institution and a conversation that needs to happen internally, where colleagues are talking with each other about the values of the institution, how they're going to live those values, um, and and it's something that has to do with the relationship that the institution has with the with the wider community. And that's actually one of the things I, I was wondering about in this. Uh, when you think about Louisville, Kentucky, or if you think about any community in Texas, um, there are certain institutions. I mean, there are 
hospitals and schools and uh, community uh, organizations and uh, educational institutions that really act as the pillars that hold that can hold a community together. How do you see the University of Louisville in in that in that context? How do how can how is it and how can it be um, a leader uh, in the wider community to to address these issues? Mm. I, I think like like a lot of universities, Brother Richard, the University of Louisville likes to think it's something that it no longer is. We like to think collectively that as an institution, we are a community leader in, in, these, in these spaces. But what this moment has shown us is that the University of Louisville has a whole lot of work to do in that area. You know, when you had, and, and all of us are facing this right now, okay? When you had Ahmaud Arbery shotgun to death down in my home state of Georgia, and then you had Breonna Taylor killed here in Louisville, you had George Floyd killed in Minnesota, but we've seen more and more people killed even since those people have been killed. They just don't get as much attention, right? But the University of Louisville has the opportunity because it is the, 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 it's the castle of intellectuals, of really smart people, people who are not as easily taken in by fake news, as it were, of false history. We can examine things. I'll give you an example right now where, you know, this is a funny thing. One of my heroes is John Brown. One of my great heroes, I was very excited about the Good Lord Bird coming out of, you know, a book that, that I've read. And I was very excited about um, the Showtime um, documentary coming out as well. And I also love Ethan Hawke. I think Ethan Hawke is a fabulously interesting guy. Um, so my students tell me in class on yesterday that there's been a social movement in some quarters to cancel John Brown because he suffered from a white savior's complex. <laughs> And I'm like, what the hell is going on here? You going to cancel John Brown? John Brown's an OG. John Brown's one of the hardest white men ever, OK? And so it's important. So but on one of my social media feeds, a guy who considers himself a black nationalist, for instance, said that John Brown was, in effect, part of a movement to simply convince black people to fight in the Civil War because the union was losing. Now, as a scholar, I had to step into that conversation and say, look, the Civil War doesn't start until 1861. John Brown was involved in abolitionist work even before the Republican Party was founded in 1854. And by the time the Civil War starts in 1861, John Brown's dead. He, he raids Harper's Ferry with his sons, I might add, in 1859. Six weeks later, he's hanged. So any theory, any perspective that says that he was simply a shield for the Union to recruit Black soldiers during the Civil War is fundamentally false because he was dead before the Civil War even started. This is what intellectuals have to do, right? This is where we partner. And I saw somebody in the chat said, how do we uh, have conversations like this, these difficult conversations, controversial issues with students when quite often they don't want to have them? This is about our personalities. It's all about the way we present them to people in our classrooms, and our communities. This is the way we take the lead. The University of Louisville hasn't necessarily been interested in doing that um, for, for quite some time, but now it, wa it wants to, it says, uh, if there's been a commitment from our president that we should become the nation's premier anti-racist university. Now, I don't know what the hell that looks like, but even if we, if we even try, it means we have to shift direction, right? And so we can be leaders if we're interested in being leaders, not just being a large corporation that's worried about the generation of student credit hours, because in the generation of student credit hours, you're generating money. Now, I understand universities have a business aspect to them. Sure. That's, that's understand. We're in a capitalist society. We have to generate money. But if we lose our way and we don't think about the educational aspect, not just about making students who are going to make money, but us working to make good citizens, then it's a problem. If we make good citizens, then we're fundamentally going to have a different thrust of, as, as universities. So is, is the University of Louisville doing great right now, Brother Richard? No, no, it's not. It has a history. I mean, the pan African Studies Department, which I chair, is one of the oldest Black Studies departments in the country. It's only five years younger than the field itself. 
but we have to struggle and we have always struggled to keep these conversations on the table struggle for faculty lines struggle for resources struggle for the idea that black people should matter on the campus and off the campus so when people now are saying well yeah black lives really do matter i'm like thank god that you're finally catching up so and i will wager that the university of louisville is in the same place as most predominantly white institutions but it's up to us to steer them in different directions so that their words and their actions actually match up and they have to match up as, as our demography as our demography changes We've been talking uh, in uh, the sessions we've had uh, today about the, the place of community colleges and the needs of our communities. Uh, <clears throat> we've got massive unemployment right now and community colleges are traditionally you know, part of the solution to an unemployment crisis by getting people educated. We're also seeing, I think, a crisis of citizenship uh, in a way that I haven't seen in my lifetime, I'm 57 years old, I've never seen the country in the shape that it's in right now where the need for functioning, a functioning citizenry has ever been so great. And teaching students how to have a conversation, how to engage in these questions, how to ask the right questions. Uh, are my facts even correct? <laughs> are my assumptions, um, uh, do I really understand what I'm basing my assumptions on? Um, this is something that we are uniquely positioned to do in higher education to say, here's how we can navigate this uh, in, in, a, in a productive way, because otherwise it does just become about screaming at each other and fighting. And, and then the controversy is just something to run away from because nothing good could come from it. But if we can show that controversy is really a source of creativity and energy and uh, and a thing to build community out of as we as we work on those issues then we've really i think contributed what an institution of higher education is here to do yeah, yeah. you know you know and, and i like to reframe it um because people like to talk about controversy i like to talk about revolutionary thinking and don't be afraid of that word revolution you know revolution just means change and if we don't need change my god if we can't admit that we need change right now then we're in a really really bad place mm -hmm. let me talk about the community college system for a second all over the country and why it's so incredibly important let's deal with the reality that american education has largely failed us and it has largely failed us because education isn't impo important in America. Am I still with you, Brother Richard? Uh, you are. I'm, I'm turning the camera off just to see if it, if it does some good. Okay, I, I, I wanted to make sure, you know, with everybody doing Zooming and everything else, you know, internet connections are taxed. But the educational systems as, as we know it, they failed us, you know. And you can tell what America values. You can tell what any capitalist society values based on the amount of money they put into uh, institutions, organizations, or systems. And so we've consistently seen on the federal level and the state level, level and local levels, money being siphoned out of education from K through 12 all the way up to higher ed. Now, understand this. As I tell my daughter, people don't make as much money in this country as folks think. If you make $100,000 a year as an individual, you make more money than 93% of Americans. Only 7% of, of the population makes more than you. If you just make $100,000 a year, and God knows, individually, that does not make you rich. So as institutions of higher learning have had to compensate for the reduction in resources because people don't value education, they've elevated tuition. That's made education less and less accessible for people who do not have the financial means to get there. This is where community colleges intervene. Community colleges are usually more affordable. By their name, they're located in the community of, 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 from which a lot of the students will attend, and they serve as gateways to get kids to larger schools if they want to get four-year degrees down the line. Without the bridges of community colleges, we would lose so many students across this country, across lines of race, that it is incalculable. But what brothers and sisters, what you all are doing at community colleges and what we are doing 
right now at four year schools and research one schools like the University of Louisville where I am, we're really engaged in rescue projects. Our kids are being failed so much, especially when you talk about issues of diversity of race and them understanding that they're brothers and sisters in the human race. They've, they've been failed so badly. And by the time they get to us, we have to re-educate, re-socialize them. That's not controversial. That is essential if America is going to become what she needs to be moving forward, especially when we see the situation where mendacity is ruling the day. When we have leaders in this country that not just periodically, but daily, by the hour, by the minute, tell lies and people swallow them whole, we understand what a, what a dangerous place we're in. So what we need is a more educated, involved citizenry. And I'm not talking about just getting degrees when I talk about education. I'm talking about people who really do understand what's going on in their communities. They understand what's going on politically. They understand what's gone on historically. And they're not going to fall for that. So as a political scientist, and I'll close this question out with, with this, and then we can move on to the next. This call for people to vote. I think it's short-sighted. And I'm not telling anybody to vote Democrat or Republican. I'm an independent. I hate the Democrats and the Republicans, to be quite honest with you. I think both of the parties are hustlers right now in their current iterations. But what we need to do is try to, one, teach our children and teach our brothers and sisters who are now in manhood and womanhood what goes into America's political system and why we get the types of candidates that we get in the general elections in the first place and how we can impact that process earlier on. Because sit down and think about it. How many times have you all, who I know are longstanding voters, how many times have you voted for a candidate rather than against another? Think about that for a minute. I mean, I don't care if it's from your city council to, to the state representatives, to a, 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 a congressman, to a senator, to the president. When's the last time and how many times have you been excited about voting for somebody rather than voting against somebody that you've seen as the lesser of two evils. We can't continue to function that way, right? That is not a sustainable system with that type of dearth of committed, honest, strong, positive, and humane leadership. We can't continue to take the, handle the lies. And in every space that we're in, like the question that came up earlier when somebody said, well, avoid the, the controversial issues, some gotta be brave enough and say, I don't think you're the proper leader for us at this moment. Somebody's got to be brave enough to say, when people say we're a progressive community college, we're a progressive university, and they're saying that stuff behind the scenes, we got to say to them, look, you're a liar. I'm telling everybody that you're a liar. We need somebody in here who's going to tell the truth and deal with these issues as we move forward. So that's, that's my thought on that, Brother Richard. So I've, I've got a, a, a comment here from a member that I, I'd love to hear your reaction to. <clears throat> this uh, member says, I am a Creole from Beaumont, Texas. My mother's friends, black, white, and other, disciplined me as if they were my own mother. Growing up in a low-income family in Beaumont, I watched the demographics change from majority white to majority black. This change drove my interest in demographics and economics. Slavery was one of the driving forces for economic growth in the United States before the Civil War. How would you handle a student that tells you they are triggered by the word slavery? How would you respond to this student? Um, I, I'd love your, your thoughts on that specific case. There's another comment here from Christina Cardenas, who's one of our members at San Jacinto College, right not far from Beaumont. She said, Dr. Jones, I like how you're balancing the task of educating others and building relationships that are meaningful with students. Can you please share some activities that you've done in your courses to help students become awakened to their citizen, citizenship rights? So here we have two questions about what does it look like in a conversation that you have with students? And, and that, uh, that first question about how do you handle a student who's, who's triggered? Yeah, yeah. First of all, shout out to Creole culture. You know, some of the best food ever, <laughs> even though I must say that I suffer, I struggle with, with Creole culture and the food because I have a, a terrible shellfish allergy. And, oh, and so <laughs> a lot of the Creole food that I would like to eat, you know, I can't because my throat will swell up and I will die. 
um, <laughs> to this idea of, of, of uh, community discipline. I relate to that. You know, there was a time when, when uh, raising children was considered a community endeavor. And that's happened for a long time, especially for, for people of color. And I would imagine for a lot of our, our, our white brothers and sisters as well, you know, these days you better not discipline your own kid. Uh, Child Protective Services may be calling you, you know, so we, we have to deal with, with that as it evolves. But um, to the tougher question, people being triggered by slavery. Here's what's very important for, for our students and what I try to tell my students all the time. The first day of class, I always tell my students this, it is not my job to force you to think like me, but it is my job to force you to think, right? It is my job to force you to think. And I always tell them, I lead with this, I don't want y'all to agree. In fact, I want you to disagree because that's what will make you think. And I also tell them, I will lie to you after I just got through, you know, casting aspersions up on, on all these liars. But I tell my students, I will lie to you. If all of y'all agree, I'll play devil's advocate and I may, I may say something to you that is absolutely untrue and I'm gonna force you to deal with that because you gotta get used to dealing with that. So somebody says, look, I'm triggered by the mention of slavery. Then you're triggered by the truth, right? You're triggered by the truth. Slavery is something that happened in this country. It's not about us avoiding talking about slavery. It is about us being committed to talking about the truth about slavery because that leads to so many other conversations. If Americans really knew the tr truth about slavery, what really drove slavery, what drove the Ku Klux Klan, what drove Confederate monuments, in fact, then I think we have very different conversations. There are still people who make the argument that the Civil War wasn't about slavery. When you look at the Articles of Secession, and I have to tell people this all the time, there was no uniform Confederate uh, paper of, about secession. This came, each state had its own, from Texas to Georgia to South Carolina to Mississippi and others. If you look at their Articles of Secession, they very quickly, all of them, to a state, mention slavery early on. Very few of them talk about states' rights. They talk about slavery. So if somebody is triggered by slavery, then you're really triggered by the truth of what America has been and what it is. You're triggered by an atrocity that was committed by people that we have been taught to revere, and we can still revere them while sim simultaneously understanding that they brought some really, really dark stuff into the world while they brought some positivity. So if we look at our brothers and sisters in South Africa, you know, there was a reason that they had truth and reconciliation commissions, right? Let me say that again. Truth and reconciliation commissions. So while everybody is talking about this country is divided, the reality of the situation is Donald Trump did not divide this country on his own. This country has been divided. That's another truth. But if we want to talk about bringing this country together, not back together, but together because we've never been together, if we want to talk about that reconciliation, you can have no reconciliation without truth. And we have to work very, very diligently to imbue that in our students. And sometimes, you know, it might take, if a student is really, really triggered, really is resistant, say, hey, come to office hours, let's talk about this. Why is this triggering you? Meet that student where he or she is. That's, that's really important. Um, the second one, I, I talked too much. I forgot the second question, Brother Richard. Well, it was, uh, I'm, I'm actually, and this may, uh, we're, we're gonna run short on time here. And I, I, there, I feel like, yeah. let, let's just, to talk for the rest of the afternoon, but uh, <laughs> I, I would like, I'm wondering, can you think of something you've learned from your students? Um, I, I can imagine being a student in your class, them learning a lot, just seeing a lot of things from such a new perspective. But you talk with a lot of students from different backgrounds and, and have experiences with them. Uh, wh what is something they've taught you? Oh my God. Look, I have learned so much from my students. I cannot begin to tell you. You know, we talk about everything in my classes from cow tipping to uh, marijuana culture. I mean, this is the stuff we talk about. 
but if I could make a book suggestion to you all, if I could suggest, had to suggest one book, it's not a book that's explicitly about race. It's Paolo, and I know you all have read it because you're educators, Paolo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. When Freire talks about liberatory education versus banking education, I read that book when I was in graduate school for the first time, and I probably read it 50 times since. But what's important to me, now I'm the longest serving chair in the history of Pan-African Studies. And let me tell y'all, let me be real honest with y'all. I hate administration. It is my, it's the least favorite part of my career. You know, it has to be done, I understand that, but dealing with the bureaucracy and the budgets and the agendas and the lies, just the madness of it all, I hate that. I love the classroom. I love those students. So for me, I've always been a guy who wasn't too into the lecturing. I want to talk about students and I work very, very hard to relate historical stuff, political stuff to the contemporary stuff that students are going through. And so my, my belief is if you can connect with them there, then they are gonna teach you a hell of a lot. You know, I didn't know that they called um, um, guys who deal weed now plugs, students are telling me that. And if I can disarm them by saying a sim simple, something as simple to them as, I know all of y'all smoke weed and, and very few hands go up, right? But if I say all of y'all smoke weed and then they admit it and they get comfortable and they go, well, Dr. Jones, you don't. And I'm like, look, I've never even smoked a cigarette, okay? I have asthma. But once they get comfortable, then we can start talking about all kinds of stuff. Okay, you all know that, you know, smoking weed is illegal. So was freeing slaves a long time ago. What do you think about that? And relating those things, to, I think students are incredibly curious. Um, and I think students, um, and one thing we can learn from them too, well, a lot of things we can learn from, we're getting older every day. And so it, it, it all changes. And I, I'm excited about the young folk right now. People want to talk about how the young folk are disengaged and this and that and the other. I think one, they have a different approach to race. I don't think they're as cool with the lies. This is why they distrust American institutions. And they are willing to fight. Somebody told me, you know, one of my students yesterday said, look, we Gen Zers, we don't give a damn doc. We ready to fight about anything. And one of them says, because all of us are pretty depressed anyway. <laughs> so that was funny. So students teach me a lot. I mean, that, that's really the highlight of my, my day every day. That's, that is fantastic. Well, uh, I did want to ask you, uh, and, and I had mentioned this before, uh, uh, three books you might suggest. You mentioned one, and uh, I think Katie or Carol put a link up to that in the chat. Um, again, this will be something we'll get out to the attendees afterwards uh, so they can uh, track it down, track these resources down later. But what are some books, if you were to tell someone either new to this conversation or in a position like a faculty member needing to lead some discussions with, with students or with colleagues on campus, what are some, uh, some books or resources that you could say would really help form their thinking around these issues? I'll go three. Um, I'll, I'll just give you three. Three is a nice round number. First of all, Pedagogy of the Oppressed um, from, from Prairie. If I had to suggest one book, that, that, I would suggest that book. Um, two, I would suggest Du Bois, Souls of Black Folk. And don't just read the chapter of Mr. Booker T. Washington and others. You know, read all of Souls of Black Folk. Du Bois wrote a lot, but I would certainly um, do, do that book. The last book that, that I would suggest people to read is a newer piece, Michelle Alexander, The New Jim Crow. I think that is a, a really, really powerful book as well that shows how the prison industrial complex has, has developed. And if you don't want to read anything, watch, I think it's still on Netflix, go to Netflix and check out Ava DuVernay's documentary, 13. I think it does a good job of exploring how race has developed in America with regard to the prison industrial complex and how that's been reflective of society. So uh, those, are, those are four resources I will ask you know, people to check out if they you know, are kind of new to it all and want to, want to start somewhere. That, that's terrific. Um, I'm also thinking uh, about, it, and if you, if you have other suggestions, and can pass them along to us. We'll we'll share that uh, any list you give us with uh, with our folks. Um, 
I'm thinking also about ways that members can can join a conversation. Uh, I know for me, one thing that's been very helpful uh, has just been going on Twitter and uh, following people um, from different backgrounds. And there are African American uh, voices on Twitter that have taught me a lot. And the best thing I've found is just to shut up and <laughs> and listen and and hear what they say and how they respond to the same news I'm getting, but they're gonna see it differently. Um, and then to begin to engage in a conversation, just having listened for a while. How, but there are other ways to do it in person, community groups. Uh, do you find either in Louisville or, or online, uh, how might a faculty member become a part of these conversations, either on campus or, or outside of campus? Where you are. That, that, that's, that's, that's my advice to people. Let me say that again in case the connection is bad. Fight where you are. If something doesn't exist, then you need to create it. The first thing that you need to do is understand what all of these conversations are really about. All of these conversations are really about power, okay? The ability of individuals or, or groups to avoid dynamics where they do not have the ability to determine their own fates, where they always have to get um, um, permission from someone who doesn't look like them to initiate activities that are beneficial to groups that do look like them. That's about power, you know, creating a world where you can enter into it with a greater degree of humanity. There needs to be a more sophisticated understanding of what white supremacy is. People have a cartoonish understanding of white supremacy. They think that all white supremacy is, or white nationalism is, it's, you know, God's marching through Charlottesville, chanting Jews will not replace us, or the Ku Klux Klan, you know, in hoods, burning crosses in people's yards. That's, that's a very cartoonish understanding, elementary understanding of, of white supremacy. Here's what white supremacy really is. White supremacy is when a monochromatic group of people in every space, individuals and collectively, feel that they are the only group that have the right to know, to think, and decide. Let me say it again. When whites feel that they're the only group that have the right to know, to think, and decide. If you're at a community college or a four-year four institution or a corporation where all the top tier decision makers are white, you're at a supremacist organization. If you don't have Hispanic brothers and sisters in leadership where they can autonomously make decisions, if you don't have black brothers and sisters in a situation where they can autonomously make decisions, if you don't have LGBTQ brothers and sisters autonomously where they can make decisions, you are still having to go back to a person who is not a part of your group who gets to green light everything or stop it. So the first thing you can do, read, engage, figure out where you are on that spectrum. Two, engage with folks who do not look like you. If you're concerned about black liberation, then you need to partner with some black people. And not, the see, because academia is notorious for this. Academia is notorious for pushing black people who are the most malleable Black people, who are wedded to the status quo. They are not going to open their mouths about Black struggle. They do not have their fingers on the pulses of the Black community. Therefore, they're Black people who act most like white people. They are the ones who will get promoted. Where the Black people who resist that status quo are quite often seen as the troublemakers. We got to get away from that. Right? If you want to have some conversations with a black person, find a black person who's comfortable being black. If you say you got a black friend and your black friend is Clarence Thomas or Ward Connolly, then you don't have a black friend. I'm sorry. Okay? But once you partner with those people on your own, develop culture circles, develop reading groups on your own campus. It only takes four or five people to develop that. And then spread out into your community and partner with people in that community and talk about the issues that they want to talk about and provide some of that leadership. And once you develop those partnerships, 
then you can bring those groups together and back to your campuses to push those people who are telling you stay away from controversial issues because then you got some back, right? And so those are the places that I think is, is good for people to start. Well, and it, is there a better place in, in communities across the state of Texas to have those sorts of conversations than community colleges? We're often the, the gathering point for people in communities from Cisco, Texas to Houston, Texas, uh, to gather uh, with, a, a, with a diverse population, about 85% of community college students are, are underrepresented first generation and college students. Um, this, is, this is where the communities gather and to have the kinds of conversations you're talking about uh, is where change can really happen. And I think if, if you have students who, who maybe at the beginning are resistant to the conversation, maybe, maybe it is, it makes them a little uncomfortable. But I think when they see that it's an authentic discussion like you're describing, uh, they, they recognize that. They know this is, this is a real person I'm talking to. This is a valid point that's being made. It's something I've never heard before and I, and I want this kind of engagement. Um, those students can become your champions, uh, even if they started out uh, feeling triggered, uh, but you've got to trust that they've got it in them to have these, these discussions. Well, and isn't that what education is really all about? Edu education is all about this discomfort. Education is all about pushing the envelope. Education is about new things, not the reification of old things, right? Education is also about respecting our students, embracing them. I find that, you know, I've, I've had students come to me. Some of my white students said, Doc, I've never met a black person, and I'm letting you know right now, you know, there's been a lot of racist stuff that's been socialized into me. And I never really questioned it until I met you. And so even students, these are kids and where I'm sitting. Look, I'm 103 years old, man. I'm getting older. I'm aging in dog years by the minute. So these are kids to me at 18, 19 years old. You got to embrace them. You got to love them. Even kids who are coming with some of the most dysfunctional, twisted stuff you can imagine. And that certainly has gotten worse as misinformation has proliferated at levels we have not seen recently. Embrace those kids and say, let's talk about why you feel this way. And let's talk about a different way of seeing things. Listen to me. Don't attack them. Don't dehumanize them. Embrace them. Love them. And then they're going to be open to different conversations. At least that's my approach. You know, and don't come to them like you're smarter than them. I'm doctor this, that, and the other you know, be a human being to them. Because I think teachers, and, and you know, at core, we're all teachers. I don't care what level we're at. You know, at, we're teachers and teachers leave their fingerprints on kids more than anybody other than their parents. Respect that power, embrace that power, use it wisely and use it in a caring way. Dr. Jones, th th those are some powerful words. I, I appreciate you your thoughtfulness in this uh, conversation. Um, I noticed that Corey Johnson, the chair of our professional development committee, uh, put your Twitter handle in the, the comments. So any of you who are on Twitter, uh, uh, you might uh, check out his, his Twitter feed and uh, join his conversation. Um, I, I think it will be rewarding. And I think if we can learn to have this conversation uh, about uh, race and about systemic injustice, uh, we, we're learning to have a lot of conversations. We can talk about a lot of things more openly if we learn how to be honest and respectful with each other. Um, and if higher education does nothing else in America, uh, we need to be able to do that. So uh, Dr. Jones, thank you so much for your time and your yeah. thoughts. I, I, I can tell in the feed, I think we've, we've just started <laughs> a, a discussion that really needs to, to continue. Um, but uh, I, I think we're off to a good start here. So thank you so much. I'll stand at any time you need me, dear brother. Please reach out um, and let me say to all of you all as, as we close, thank you for inviting me to hang out with you for an hour. I'm, I, I appreciate it. And I want to say to all of you, please understand what you are. Understand why whatever powers there are in the universe has chosen you to be in this place at this time and do what you do. 
for the teachers and everybody who was supporting those teachers and our interaction with our children. There is no more important work than the work you are doing. Because if, we are, if everything we're not doing, everything we're doing is not to create a world where our children can enter into that world with a greater degree of humanity and decency and bravery, then we're not doing our work. And I, I, I trust that you all are doing that work. So keep on doing it. Anything that, that I can do to help you, please don't hesitate to let me know. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother. Well, everyone, uh, with, uh, with that in mind, let's, let, let's keep these words in, in all the other conversations we're having. Uh, we'll be having some more this afternoon and tomorrow. Uh, let's take a short break. Everybody can refresh their coffee or stretch their legs or do some jumping jacks or <laughs> whatever you need to do. Uh, we'll be starting <clears throat> our next session in about uh, uh, 10 minutes at 3.15. And uh, we'll be talking uh, COVID on a COVID update about what's happening at, at colleges around the state, uh, and do some some level setting there. Um, uh, Ricky, I'm uh, I've, it, it's just been a pleasure getting to know you. Uh, I really appreciate your thoughtfulness. Uh, your students uh, are <laughs> are truly blessed. So. Um, uh, thanks for the work that you're doing in Louisville. And uh, I hope if we have a conference in person one day, hopefully that those days will come back. I would love to have you with us for one of those. Most definitely. And as I told you, Brother Richard, love those glasses. <laughs> yes. <we're laughs> yeah, we, we didn't plan this. It just, uh, it just happened this way. <laughs> Okay, thanks everyone. Right, if right, if right. you want to disconnect, you can use the same link uh, to rejoin the meeting or just put it on hold and we'll come back here in about 10 minutes. Thanks very much.